Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. One thing about God that you can conclude, and that is God is a God of order. Decency and order. Order has to do with ordination. Everything is ordained to be in a specific spot in a process. So protocol has to do with order. It has to do with process. If you study the Old Testament that God reveals his worship plan in, the first thing God told Pharaoh, Yes, Pharaoh. He says, Moses, you tell Pharaoh for me. I want him to let my people go. And the first reason was not to go to a land. We think that God wanted Pharaoh to take them to a land, to, to go, let them go take to, to a land. That was not the motivation. The first thing God instructed was tell Pharaoh to let my people go, watch this, so that they may come out in the wilderness to worship. To worship. God says, look, Pharaoh, where you have them is apparently not the right environment. So I want them to change their environment. I wanted to change their location. Bring them out to the desert, Moses, to be with me that they may worship me. Protocol. Moses eventually got them out. You know the story. When they got out, God said, okay, Moses, my next instructions. Build me a place. It has to be portable. In other words, you can set it up, break it down, set it up, and break it down because we're going to be moving. I want a mobile sanctuary. That is what God called the tabernacle. Tabernacle, write the word down, tabernacle is a big word, can you spell it? The word tabernacle means habitation. Habitation. Tabernacle means to live in or with. God says, build me a tabernacle. Build me a place that I can come and hang out with you guys. Vernacular language here. I don't want to stay in heaven only, but I want to be in your presence and you in mine. But you got to build a certain place for me. Now, here is a mystery. All of you have been saying, God is everywhere. Right? I mean, you say that often. God is omnipresent. Could it be that that is not completely correct in the sense that it doesn't mean he personally in his presence is everywhere? Because here God, who is omnipresent, telling Moses to build a specific place for him to dwell. Um, I'm trying to find a human example. I'm so weak in this because God is so deep you can't find vocabulary sometimes. All right. Let me ask you a question. Where are we right now? We are in a building in the Bahamas in a certain street. So you are in the Bahamas. Are you in your house right now? No, but you are in the Bahamas. So you are present in the Bahamas, but you are not at home. It's possible to be present, but not at home. Some of you are getting it. God dwells everywhere, but he's trying to find a home. <laughs> And God does not dwell 
in temples made by hands, Paul says. And God does not dwell just anywhere. God inhabits, the word there is what? Tabernacle. Where? I can't hear you. In the praises of his people. But God told Moses, build me a place that I may dwell among you. And God gave him a design, very beautiful design. It was a rectangular shape pattern. And on the inside were three smaller rectangles. The outer rectangle is called the outer courts. The middle rectangles, obviously, is called the middle courts. And then the center was a small little area, and that was called the inner courts. And God told Moses, now when the people come to me, let them come to the gate of the outer courts, and then let some of the priests come in the inner, the, the, the outer courts, and they must do certain things. And it was prescribed specifically what they must do. Then he says some must come into the middle court and they must do certain things. And then one comes in to the holies of holies. Procedure. Protocol. And then he says only that one that makes it in can come near to, see that box up there? Get a shot of that box camera. It was a place that was called the Ark of the Covenant. Covenant means contract. In that box that Moses built, he put in the box the Ten Commandments God gave him. He put the budding rod of Aaron and he put some manna. He kept some in a jar and put it in the box to remind the people of some great things that we don't even get into. But and on the seat on the top of that, where the angels you see there, the top of that is called the mercy seat. The thing on top, the covering, is called the mercy seat. The priest would walk in and he would pour the blood right in the middle of those angels. And the blood would land on the top of the box, the mercy seat. He would then put blood on the four corners of the box. We would have big horns representing the power of God. And as soon as he did that, now the room was black. Only a candle was in that room. Suddenly the presence of God would come and dwell right between the angels. And the priests would literally be in the presence of God. When the presence of God came, the entire nation was affected. From that one little box in that little room, the entire nation was affected. Everybody prospered. Every battle they won, everything that went against them failed because of that presence in that little room. Now God said, tell the priest, do not come in here with any sin in your life. Why? There's procedure. There's protocol. If any man comes here and there's iniquity found in him, God says he will die instantly. So whenever a priest went into that little room, they would tie a rope around his right leg. A long rope and they would let him in as he goes and they let the, the, the rope go if he drops dead they'll just pull him out and they'll say next now I don't know how many of you would have volunteered for ministry at that time some of you all can't wait to get in ministry but that's ministry at the highest level what was the priest trying to get into the presence of God some of you need a rope around your leg today because some of us have no idea of respect for God's awesome presence chewing gum while we worship it checking our face fixing our hair looking at our watch and God saying, you know something I need some ropes <laughs> respect for God's presence is an awesome thing thank God for the mercy seat procedure now, why do God have three courts? And I want to deal with this very quickly. There's a lady up on the screen, you'll see in a minute, and she is a royalty. Her name is Queen Elizabeth. 
of England, Great Britain. You from England here know much about royalty. Royalty is a different kind of life from the commoner, they call it, the commoners. First of all, if you go to visit Buckingham Palace, which we've had the occasion to, to actually go there, and I had the privilege of actually going in there one time as a guest. It's incredible. You can go into Buckingham Palace and never see the Queen. Anybody here? The place is designed in such a way that you can actually go in there, have a big party, and never see the Queen. Because to get to the Queen, you've got to go through a series of rooms and etiquette training. You can't just go drop in on the queen. You won't follow this. You actually have to be prepared. Everybody say prepared. To see Queen Elizabeth. They have to prepare you. And it's a very difficult preparation. When you go to see a king or a queen, you must go through what they call royal protocol training, etiquette training. And they tell you and instruct you what to do. And if you don't do it, you are arrested and cast out. And so you proceed based on your qualification training. Well, let's read how God courts work. Psalm 65 verse 4. Blessed are those who choose and bring near to live in your courts. We are filled with the good things of your house. Mark that scripture please. Very important scripture. God says, blessed are you who choose to come near my courts. Watch this. To live in them. Normally when you go to visit a royalty, you don't stay there. But according to God, he's the only king who wants you to set up residence in the courts. To live in his house. Why? The last line is important. Because you are going to be filled with good things. Of what? His house. The key to getting blessed is to get in God's house. I'm not talking about this building. I'm talking about his courts. Let's find out the benefits of the courts today. Psalm 82, 84 verse 2 says, My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. Psalm 84 verse 10. Look at this verse. Better is one day in the course of the Lord than a thousand days anywhere else. There must be something about the course of the Lord that, are, that is so wonderful that David says one day is worth a thousand anywhere else. Let me see if I can put some value on that. David says you work for, th for a thousand days and get paid and you still won't get what I got in one day in God's courts. Anybody following me? He says, a thousand days anywhere else is not near one day in God's courts. You can go to the doctor and spend a thousand days getting treatment. And David says, I'm sick just like you. And if I get in courts for one day, I get healed. Getting into God's courts, he says, is worth a thousand days anywhere else. All right, let's take a look at this. What are the courts of the Lord? Psalm 1,100, say 1,000. Psalm 100, verse 4. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Okay, that's no problem. Now you're getting into the gates. But go beyond that and enter his courts with praise. Go beyond the gates and get into the courts. Every king and queen got to have courts. Psalm 96, verse 8. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. 
bring an offering and then come into his courts worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness Isaiah chapter 1 verse 12 when you come to appear before me says the Lord who has asked thee of this you trample my courts kings are very sensitive about their courts kings control their courts they control who comes into it what happens there look at what God says but his course look at it again he says when you come to appear before me who has asked this of you this trampling of my courts God is a little bit upset how dare you come into my courts and the word trampling could be defined or interpreted as totally ignoring and abusing my protocol you are acting disrespectful in my courts how dare you he says let's find out why we're gonna move quickly here because we're gonna finish in a minute a court what is a court write this down a court is the personal and private environment of a king what is a court say it out loud what is a court once again what is a court the personal and private environment so what is a court it's an environment it's an environment <laughs> the environment affects the thing in it if I put a seed an apple seed a mango seed on your windowsill at home on the tile and leave it there for 50 years what would happen what would happen not necessarily die it'll be there but what would happen to it nothing it will not produce what's on the inside I discovered this a few years ago and I told you this during my series on glory that there's nothing more important than environment write that down again there's nothing more important than environment I thought the seed was important no it isn't the environment is more important than the seed because even though the seed have all that power to bring forth an orchard it is totally dependent on the environment to be right come on y'all talk to me no matter how great you are as a person if you are in the wrong environment you won't produce yourself now what is a court read it again a court is the personal and private environment of the king now the king really is not too excited nor concerned what's going on in the streets what's going on in the, you know the bigger country out there what's happening in other nations there's one area that the king controls and that is his personal environment his courts let's find out why second definition courts are progressive there's not just one court of a king all kings and queens have a number of courts because courts again are designed to control the environment of the king and therefore the king gradually lets you closer to him based on the court you qualify to pass why are there three courts here's why point number three the outer courts were the place of preparation and training to enter the king's presence so if you notice when you read the Bible it says enter his gates plural with thanksgiving and enter his courts plural with praise now obviously God is saying look the first preparation to enter my presence is you got to start in the outer course with what praise praise very specific etiquette praise don't come in there complaining don't come in there you know grouchy and all kind of bitterness in your heart don't come in there gossiping they put you out oh by the way if you study courts this is very important every court of every king has soldiers now why them soldiers there they ain't there for beauty they ain't there for decorations the soldiers are there with weapons so in case you don't qualify 
they encourage you to leave. Are you with me? God has the same thing. He has soldiers. That's why he has cherubims and seraphims. And they are different angels with different assignments. The seraphims are the ones with all the eyes. They get eyes in the front of their heads, the back of their heads. All their wings got eyes. There's eye, eyes in their backs. I mean, the Bible describes the strange creatures. And they are, they are the Bible calls them, uh, uh, Seraphims that watch for the glory of God. In other words, they are the soldiers, man. When they see anything that doesn't line up, they knock it dead. You remember the priest in the Old Testament who tried to touch the ark? Do you know who killed them? It wasn't God. And seraphims did some stuff. Anybody with me? They decided to bypass protocol. You know, it's incredible. Uh, they were carrying the ark, remember? They had to carry the ark on this, on this uh, uh, little trolley with the donkey. And the ark began to slide. You remember the story? And one of the fellows was standing by, one of the priests was standing by, and he saw the ark getting ready to slide. They know God ain't going to slide. Even if God looked like he's dropping, make sure you prepare yourself before you try to catch him. You all understand? Every kid is serious. This priest went to help God out. And he was killed when he touched the ark. Why? You don't touch this unless you got blood on a big thumb, blood on your nose, blood on both ear, and blood on your big toe. He had no blood. Violated protocol. Seraphim killed him. And the Bible says that the ark was leaning for a while. Why? Ain't nobody going there next to touch that. Everybody say, hey, Sam, you go. No, you go. You the chief priest. <laughs> nobody touched it. Protocol. Number three, number four, rather, the inner courts are the place of the king's personal presence. You could be in the king's courts but not be in the king's presence. Many church meetings have a great time in the outer courts and then they go home. They never experience the presence of the king. Some people even go into the middle courts, have a good experience, but they never quite got into the king's presence. Royal protocol is a requirement for all royalty and God has set up his protocol let's find out the purpose of the courts real fast number one the courts of a king is to maintain the right atmosphere for the king that's why God gave us Eden Eden is God's env environment for his own presence and when God created you in his image he also had to put you in the same presence so he made Eden Eden is God's atmosphere for productivity God needs Eden Eden is the place of his presence it's an environment that is conducive to God. And God gave Adam the same thing. Eve, Eden is not a place. It's an environment. That's why the archaeologists can't find it today. It's not a place. It moved. That's why it's called Eden. Eden means the moment for the spot of the presence of God. And so God gave Adam his presence because Adam is just like God. You are just like God. Let me put it this way. You cannot function without the right environment. And the environment God prescribed to you is Eden. So the most important thing you need to do right now and all the rest of your life is to praise the Lord. <laughs> I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise along shall continually be where? In my mouth. Why? Because the Lord inhabits. You throw Paul and Silas in jail. Paul says, I got him in secret. We can complain or praise. Complaining keeps Eden away. Praise attracts it. And we function when we get in Eden. So Silas, let's sing. They started singing. I mean, Joshua saw that city, strong, bound up city with walls. Joshua said, Lord, what should I do? God says, get the singers. <laughs> Don't get the military guys first. Get the singers, he says. And let the priests march around the city with the ark and let them sing. Why? Because I want to dwell and that place is too small. So when I try to get in, I'll break it up. By the way, seven is the number of perfection. 
when you when you perfect praise you got yourself a guess he's coming you going through a little difficulty right now I don't know what it is you need to matter of fact I want you to do this just try this this week okay take all the bills you got at home on that little dresser Put them on the floor when you get home, and I want you marching around on seven and just sing. Lord, this ain't no joke. Oh, yes. Amen. Amen. You start praising God, your business ain't doing too well. I want you to march around the business on the inside before anybody gets it. And just say, I love you, Lord. I praise you. You are awesome, wonderful, powerful, magnificent. You alone are God. I extol you, I exalt you. I bless your name. And let the presence of God come in that particular business. Now, the fellow down the road got the same business, but he ain't got the presence. The atmosphere. The second purpose of a court is to control the environment for the royal presence. A king controls his environment. I can't stress, stress this enough. That's why the kingdom of God is so important to learn. You cannot function in the kingdom of God without God's presence, and yet you cannot do that without praise and worship. To protect the attitude of the king. This third one is important. Write this down. Everyone write this down, please. The purpose of a court is to protect what? The attitude of the king. This sounds very interesting. An upset king is a dangerous king. If you read the book of Proverbs, written by a king, all through that book, I want you to look at the word king in your computer, if you got it, and press search. And when the scriptures come up, read all the scriptures. You will find this statement throughout that particular book. It says, do not make a king angry. That's right. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's right. Now, most of us do understand, what are you talking about? Let me tell you something. An angry king is bad news. So the, the cause of the king is to do what? Protect the king's attitude. You want the king to be happy. So the king wants to be happy too. So the king controls this particular area where his throne is. He likes it to be a certain way so he can always be happy. If you read scriptures, uh, in a number of places, when they had bad news for the king, they had to discuss who was going to take it. Yeah. Come on, read the Bible. And they said, now who going to tell him? When, when David's son died, boy, this is not, they, who, who going to tell him? Because if the king get mad, see, if a king get angry, now remember, whatever a king says is law. So if the king get mad in a moment, he can say, kill you, and you are dead. So you don't want to make him mad, because he might say, may you be poor forever. Oh, God have mercy. Everything you have, they take away from you. You understand what I'm saying? So the king's attitude is important. Keeping the king happy is good for the citizens. Watch this. The fourth reason for the court is to maintain order and standard that reflects the king. To maintain what? Order and standard to reflect the king. In other words, you could tell what kind of king a king is by the courts that are around him. If a king has a shabby court with plastic chairs, <laughs> Linoleum on the floor. Yes, plastic cups. Then that tells you what kind of king he is. If his servant's walking around in Terra Lynn, well, that's an old piece of cloth, isn't it? Remember Terra Lynn, Sister Moss? Terra Lynn, holy Sister Moss? Terra Lynn, too old. How about, what's the other one? Polyester? Okay. Yeah, if the servants are wearing polyester, then that reflects the king. In other words, how the people look and how the, the furniture is, is directly a reflection of the king's value. So the courts, listen to me carefully now, the courts were decorated based on the value of the king. Now, those of you who have been to Buckingham Palace, you'll remember this if you ever had a prison. We, we, we went in a big dining room where the queen eats with guests. I walked in the place, the place as big as this room, <laughs> the dining room, big like this, on the roof, the ceiling, had some chandeliers, big as your house. 
And then the roof was gold. And then the fellow say, that's real gold. I say, what? You mean if I take some of the wallpaper, I could, yeah. Get rich of the wallpaper. The chairs were not imitation mahogany. The real thing. The door handle was silver, but it was not coated silver. It's the real thing. And I'm wondering, all this wealth is in this room on the walls. Why? He said, because the place must represent the person. So we read in our last session, we did this week with me, that when God talks about Eden, he described the place. He said the carpet was like fiery stones. And it says that even the angels around him, including Lucifer, had diamonds and, and, and sapphire set in their bodies. That means all the servants around were walking diamond chests. That's how lavish God is. God put emeralds on his servants to wear. The carpet in the throne room of God, the Bible describes it, Ezekiel 28, is actually made of jasper and stone, of diamonds. You walk on stuff we fight over. The streets that leads to God's center of power are paved with gold. The gates, God got them carved out of pearl. He, what kind of king is it? He, and that's your daddy and you scrapping? Man, say amen, man. Amen. You see, the, 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 the environment of the king reflects the king. Why? What's the purpose for the courts? The king's court, and I put his point of here, is the atmosphere and environment of the king. And it always includes these things. Number one, Beauty and splendor. Number two, dancing. Number three, singing. Four, music. And five, it always includes jesting. And number six, every king's court is filled with celebration and praising the king. Write this down. This is the key to God's courts too. Now, it's not just the key to God's courts. It's the key to every king's court. That's why God calls himself a king. And he's referring to people who know what kings are like. So he's telling them, whatever you know about kingship, treat me that way. Now, let's go over the list very quickly. Every king's court, the king requires these things. One, beauty and splendor. He wants it to look splendorous. That's why he puts gold and silver and fine jewels and carpets and, and wallpaper and, and, and crystal chandeliers. I mean, it has to be splendor. Why? It exposes his splendor. Himself. The Bible uses that word to describe God. Praise the Lord in his splendor. Bless the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. God is very lavish. Oh dear. I say oh dear. Now, I have been dealing with, I was born in Bain Town, folks. And you know, we had to clean the plate. Bain Town, folks, is a place down here where they used to call, you know, the where the poor people was born and live. That's where I was born, okay? They call it the area, you know, kind of a low-income area. But that's where I was born. And we had a big family, so when we ate, we had to clean the plate. Why? We were still hungry. <laughs> so we grew up with the mentality, you don't waste nothing. Nothing. So we used to keep everything, even our shoes with holes in them. We used to keep it and clean it, even though we don't wear it no more. We kept it just in case it was a rainy day. So people who are poor keep old things. Because they are afraid they might need it again. Interesting. The mentality. They, they, they are not lavish. As a matter of fact, if you give a poor person something that is very valuable, they will, re they will complain about it. No, you didn't have to do that. I don't deserve this. Why you spend so much money on me? Oh, I can't believe you. You think that much of me? You could have spent this and give it to somebody else and have the poor and blah, 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 blah. Sound familiar? A woman bought one year's wages and spent it on Jesus' body. And the disciples said, this is a waste. He said, no, this is beautiful. He said, this is beautiful. Why? 
I deserve every cent she put on me. He was lavish. God put on his carpet, which you put on your finger. Ladies and gentlemen, y'all look at me, man. This is serious. Y'all look at me funny. God rich. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Two weeks ago, I was telling y'all I picked up at the airport in a Royal Rolls Royce. I mean a 2002 Rolls Royce. Picked up. Going to speak to Craftlow Dollars. Church. Chauffeur in the back. Maybe I sit down. I tell my wife, I said, get used to this. I could get used to this. Now, why would the Lord expose you something like that? He's trying to elevate your thinking. Hallelujah. Write this down. God will never expose you to what he doesn't want to give you. God exposes you to prepare you for what he's getting ready to give you. So if God takes you to someone's house, and it's a nice house, and you eat in there, God's telling you something. Y'all ain't listening to me. If God lets you drive in someone's nice car, don't just sit there smile. God talking to you, say, look, I want you to get used to this feeling. Yes, I'm getting you ready for your own blessing. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Lord, have mercy. When somebody buy you a nice shoe, God's trying to tell you about to get a closet full. So get used to how they feel. Yeah. Praise God. It reflects the king. Reflects the king. Next, dancing. Every king in history, study the history, French kings, German kings, English kings, Spanish kings, check all the history. Go to the history book read. They love dancing. Matter of fact, there were dancers that were trained only to dance in the king's presence. Some of you wondering why the church is supposed to have dance. I, mean, I thought I'd been Baptist. No dance in the church. Listen. The ba Anyhow, let me stop. <laughs> can I touch something? I can touch this. I got to touch this. See, this looks too good. I was brought up in a Baptist church, and I better get Pentecostal church, etc. Some of you all had the experience. And you know, they, they would read the scriptures. Praise the Lord in the dance. There'll be no dancing in the church. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> You read in the Bible, the Bible said, praise the Lord in the dance. Praise the Lord in the dance. Praise means to speak well of, to celebrate him. In what? The dance. Now, there are a couple kind of dances we get. In the Pentecostal church, they call it bucking. <laughs> Thank you. Hit somebody head off, hot fly one way. Okay? Now, maybe that's a dance to you. That's you. But you couldn't, in the king's court, you couldn't do that. Because the king deserves the best. So the king used to have people, schools of training people to dance just for the king. You don't come in any kind of movement and any kind of... <laughs> you got to go and get what? Training for royal protocol. When the king called for his dancers, they came out dressed in their uniforms. Their movements were synchronized, and the king would sit there, and he would make them, he'd, they'd make him feel like he's the king. That's the best. Dancing. Dancing brings the king joy. That's why we have dances in church now. Find God. And some of you also try and get used to it. I mean, it's tough to get used to because you see...
ain't dancing for you. You ain't the king. Come on, praise the Lord. They dancing for Jesus and Christ. Now watch this. I'm going to blow your mind. In the book of Hebrews chapter 2, it says, He also rejoices over his church and dances in the midst of the candlesticks. You all don't understand the Bible. I ain't got time to good. But read it in chapter 2. In other words, when Jesus gets excited, he's sitting on the throne watching you. But when he sees you getting so, mm -hmm, he pitched up too. And Christ said, yeah. Woo! The Bible says he dances in the midst of the candlesticks. And he rejoices over you with joy. Joy means to leap around wildly with praise. Imagine you make Jesus dance. And a happy king is a dangerous king because he starts giving things away. Y'all ain't get it yet. Some of y'all only dance. No, let me say something here too. We come to a place like this and we watch the dancers dance. The king wanting you to dance for yourself. So when, you, when they finish, get up and do your little piece. When you go home in your kitchen, and you're fixing things. Put that salt in while you're dancing. Press, chop the onions. Hey, hey. Woo-hoo. Hey, hey. You bless the Lord. You'll have more onions than you ever can believe. He bless you with onions. Come on, clap your hands. Praise God. He said, dance before the Lord. <laughs> Don't cut your finger, but go ahead. Bless the Lord. Amen. And this is important because we need to understand that, that God loves us to bring joy to him. You remember I told you about Herod. Herod said to that young girl, if you dance to me, I'll give you anything you want. All kings do that. He said, even up to half of my kingdom. He's a teenage girl. But that's not bad. He wanted to dance. I wonder what God promised you lately. You don't, oh boy, this is going to be deep. You don't have to pay a king anything to get something from it. Just make him happy. That's important. You want something from God? Start singing. Start shouting. Start clapping hands. Start celebrating. Hey, God loves it. Asaph is not just some conference. It is the heart of of his presence always praising always sanctified always worshiping God it's music kings like music look at that number three they love music Woo! love music now there's some churches who say they don't believe in music you all know them churches they don't believe in music I don't know what kind of Bible they get but the one I got full of music David was a king, keep in mind. And David says, play upon the lyre, play upon the harp, rejoice in the Lord, beat the high cymbal, beat the small cymbals, celebrate with the tambourine, let me hear some noise, David says. Solomon was a king, and he was depressed. What did he do? Call for music. David was a, was a worshiper, and the king liked his presence. You want God to hang around you? Sing all the time. I give you all a revelation. Write it down. If I want God to be in my company all the time, I should sing all the time. Kings love happy people. Because people make him happy. I believe God is, is stay away because we're always complaining. I get under this. They always get in the head of me. I don't know what's wrong with life. Life always because you know some I stay this this is depressing. It's depressing. I will bless the Lord. I can't hear you. At all times, and his praise shall be. I will say of the Lord, you are my refuge, you know. Boy, he said, hey, make me feel good. That means I got to refuge you. <laughs> you are my refuge and my fortress. You are my help. Ooh, you call him that, he got to help you. That's the last one, you see. Look at, look at jesting, hey? Look at this one, this number four, jesting. If you study history, now folks in America won't understand this much, but kings hired 
Jesters. A jester is a comedian. That's where comedians come from. They came from the jesting program of kings. A king would hire jesters just to make him laugh. So when the king was sad with anything, they would call for the jester. The jester would dress funny. He would put on masks and funny clothing, and he would even walk to make the king laugh, see? And then he would tell jokes and give irony and satire and, and all kind of ironies and stuff. He would give stories, and, and the king would laugh. And when the king got happy again, the king would say, all right. And he started giving commands. Everybody get blessed. Make God laugh today. Make God laugh. Make him happy. Tell him how good he is, how big he is. Tell him, but God, your hand's so big, the world look like a grain of sand. <laughs> God say, I like this guy. <laughs> Why didn't Job get blessed? Job says, the Lord, oh Lord, thou hast in thy little finger and your thumb the universe. Because I like this guy. And he blessed him seven times more. Celebrating the king. Now this, this last one, I want to just drive him on this one. Kings love celebration and praising in their courts of the king. Of the king. Now what I mean by this is, kings love... them about themselves I don't know how to explain this it's a strange thing kings love to be told about themselves the more the servants or the subjects tell the king how good he is how great he is how wonderful he is that makes the king bless them more with good things because the king wants to hear it secondly when you tell a king something that he is, watch this, he has to prove it. Oh boy. It's the law of kingly protocol. When you tell a king anything about who he is, he has to prove it. Someone got it. So, when you tell a king, you are great, now he got to do something to prove that to you. My king is awesome. Now he got to do something to prove that to you. My king is rich. Now he got to do that. He can give you a bunch of stuff to prove it. My king ain't got no sickness. Now he can make sure everything around him full of health. Okay, let me try it again. God is the king of the universe. Moses says, Lord, what is your name? Because look, I can tell you what to call me because I like myself. Watch this now. Here's my name. My name is Jehovah blank. Now, whatever you want from me, fill in the blank. You only get the king. I am a king. Talk to me about myself. Okay, he said, Jehovah Rapha. He said, good, here comes healing. Poof. Whatever you call a king, he got to prove. So God says, bless me. How did you bless the Lord? To bless someone means to call forth hidden potential. Oh man, somebody was teaching this week, I don't know if it was Lamar or, or I think it was Ron Cannoli. He said something, it hit me. He said the three Hebrew boys said to the king, Oh king, live forever. King liked to hear that. Oh king, live forever. He said, king, 
Nebuchadnezzar. We cannot bow down to your golden idol. Watch them now. They said, because we worship a higher king. Now you the king, we like you. But you violating our other king's law. Now watch their words. Now keep in mind the invisible king listening. And they're about to say something about him. They said, we cannot bow down to your golden idols, O king Nebuchadnezzar. And you will throw us in the fire and our king will deliver us. Now he put pressure on his king. He says, and even if he doesn't deliver us, we still won't bow. All heaven, God, heaven say now, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nebi, you're in trouble today. Come on, clap your hands. Hallelujah. Lift your right hand, everybody. Say, say, Lord Jesus, all my bills are paid. Go ahead and thank him now. Put pressure on it. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? It only works if you believe it. It's not just saying it. You got to believe that. My king's kingdom is filled, of, filled with health. No sickness. Can you say it? My king's kingdom is filled with health. No sickness. Now you put pressure on the king. You got to become that. Whatever Moses called him, he had to become. Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shalom. He had to become those things. They love for you to talk to them about who they are. God save our gracious king. Long live our noble king. God save the king. What are we doing? What are we doing when we, when we do that? We are singing praises to this person. And we're telling them good things. Born to rule over us. They love to hear that. You are Lord. You are Lord. You see now, if you're smart, you'll sing it with me and loud too. Let me tell you why. When you tell them you are Lord, Lord means what? Owner. In other words, you are in charge of everything about me. My mortgage, my rent, my bills, my phone company. You in charge. You are Lord. You are Lord. That's how it works. You have risen from the dead. And you're my owner. Hallelujah. Sing if you want to sing. I ain't getting in your business. Every town will confess one day. And I'm doing it right now. Jesus Christ, you're my Lord. Every bill was just transferred to him just now. Come on, clap your hands for the king one time. Praise God. That's what worship is all about. Whatever you call a king, he has to become. Celebrate the king. It's the power of a king's court. Coming down to the end here. Access to the king's presence. Access to the king's favor. Access to the king's court is access to his wealth. Access to the king's court is access to his protection. Access to the king's court is access to his pleasure. Access to the king's court is access to his blessings. Access to the king's court is access to his goodwill. Access to the tape when the meeting is over. <laughs> the courts of his presence. Psalm 3120. This is, this is an important teaching, folks. It's going to set you up for the rest of the year. They're going to bless you for the rest of the year. If you get this teaching, you're going to have a good year. Psalm 3120 says, In the shelter of your what? Presence, you what? Hide me. If I can just get in your presence, I'm protected. And you will keep them safe from accusing tongues. Proverbs 25, 6 says, Do not exalt yourself where? In the king's presence. Very important statement. When you get to the presence, get low, low, low. 
I found out something about kings. And I've spoken to people in royalty about this as well. It's shocking. The lower you get under a king, the more he takes responsibility for you. Let me put it another way. If you cast yourself completely on a king's grace, the king is obligated to take care of you. Put it another way. If you ever rebel against a king's authority, you've also cut off his good pleasure. <laughs> God loves to hear. You are my refuge. God loves to hear. I look to your hills for whence come with my help. Now God knows you got money in your pocket, but he'd like you to tell him where you got it from. Yeah. Come on, talk to me. Amen. And when you tell him where you, you know you thank him where you got it from, he gives you more because he wants to keep hearing it. You must See, when you get rich, the Bible's warn you, don't forget God. Because God gave you that wealth so you can talk about Him. Don't exalt yourself after you get a little piece of blessing and forget God. God will take the stuff from you. Because the blessing is for you to talk about Him to Him about Him. The lower you get under a king, the more He takes care of you. Kings love submission. And he loved to submit it. Look at Ecclesiastes 8.3. Powerful stuff. It says, be not in a hurry to leave the king's presence. I know you got to go eat right now and everything else, but uh, this is an interesting one. Yes. Royal protocol is very, very strange. This is in the Bible here. Do not be in a hurry to leave the king's presence. See that, see that gate there? That gate. That's a photograph of the gate to the Buckingham Palace. Look at that gate. The gold on it is real. I want you to I put a picture there so you can see the, the gate. It's a beautiful gate. The gold on the gate is real. Now don't go pinch it now. I know it's going to take knife and thing. <laughs> Leave the people gold alone, all right? Got, they got soldiers there, so you'll be ministered to. <laughs> all right? You get in the, in the presence of the king. Here's what happens in the presence of the king. The benefits of the presence of the king. We close on this. But this, is, this, this is all about. What's the benefits of the presence of the king? Number one, the presence of the king has some benefits. First of all, the king himself is in his presence. So when you got the king, you got all that he rules and owns. Number two, the presence of the king is the presence of his power. When you get into the inner courts, you are in the midst of his power. Anything is possible when you get to the king's power. Number three, the presence of the king is the presence of his favor. When you get in the king's presence, you set yourself up for miracles. Whatever the king says happens. He makes things happen. With one word, I mean, one of the most beautiful things about Nehemiah is that this guy was working in the courts. That's a good job. Nehemiah had a plan, didn't he? Had a desire to go and do something. The advantage he had was that he was right in the king's presence. Now, if you read the book, it keeps saying he was in the king's presence. He was in the king's presence. He was in the presence of the king. He served in the presence of the king. He had the cup bearer in the presence of the king. Presence. That presence word is important. He was in the room. The king looked at him one day and he was depressed. And the king says, why are you depressed? And Nehemiah said, because my people are trodden down. The city is broken down. The walls and, and I'm not happy because my city is in trouble. And the king says, well, what do you want to do about it? He says, I want to go and rebuild the wall. The king said, no problem. I'm the king. He said, tell you what, I'm going to give you letters today. See the power of favor? You can get wood, you can get stones, you can get mortar, and if anybody touch you, the power of a king's word, they will have to deal with me, he says. When you enter God's presence, like we did today in worship, and God talks to you, when you leave this building, you are immune to problems. If anyone touch you when you leave God's presence, the presence will destroy them. He takes protection of his own who are in his presence. 
Fourthly, the presence of the king is the presence of his glory, his nature. And finally, the presence of the king is the presence of his wealth. Everything the king owns is available in his presence. The key is to his presence. You must be invited. Write this down. This is this protocol. This is taken right from the, right from the list of protocol for kings. You must be invited. You cannot enter a king's presence without invitation of the king. Secondly, your physical appearance must be right. Matter of fact, kings require a certain dress for the people that come in their presence. You cannot enter the king's presence with slippers on, head all tied up, and plop down. Kings have certain physical requirements. You remember God giving his requirements to Moses? And he, he said, tell the Levites to wear certain clothes. I don't want no sweat. I want four, you know, 12 stones on the chest. I want a sash made of a certain type of cloth. I want to have some goblets at the bottom of the dress. And I want just a certain number of them. And I want an apron folded a certain way. I mean, God said, look, I want them dressed right. You don't just wander into the king's presence. Let's take it spiritually. Were you dressed to come here today? Spiritually? Some folks put on a tie, but they ain't dressed properly. Put on a nice dress, but come in all kind of dirt. Eh? And you come to worship what? A spiritual king? Now you look nice to us, but I wonder what he see. Trampling the king's courts? If I regard iniquity in my heart, the king will not hear me. He won't give me an audience. Iniquity is what? Invisible sin, like jealousy. You don't commit adultery, but you just envy somebody. God says, no, you can't come to my courts. Who will ascend to the mount of the Lord? God says, I'll tell you who will ascend. Those who has a clean hand and a pure heart. Now the hand you can see, it's the heart that's invisible. He said, both got to be clean. Got to dress right. Thirdly, mental preparation. They train you to go and see Queen Elizabeth mentally. They tell you what to say, what not to say, when to say it, how long to say it, when to shut up. As a matter of fact, do you know it's etiquette before royalty that you ain't supposed to speak until they invite you to talk? Sometimes we talk so fast to God, God don't know what we're talking about. God says, you know something, you came in here, and ever since you came in here, you've been talking. You violate protocol. That's why the first, the Bible says this, watch this. It says, the Lord is in his holy temple now. Listen, when he gets in his place, shut up, he says. The Lord is in his holy temple, do what? Let all the earth keep silent before him. God said, look, when the king show up, you don't talk until I tell you to talk. Some of our prayer meetings, God has leave the prayer meetings. I talk about your private prayer meeting too, at home. You come to God, a long list. I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that. And I want two of these, five of these. And God said, you know something? You came in here and never said hello to me yet. You ain't praise me, thank me, sanctify me, glorify me, magnify me. You got this list. You're in the king's present, girl. Shut up and just meditate. And listen, let me tell you what to pray for. Oh, it gets heavy. You don't tell a king what to do. Fourthly, Procedure preparation. You got to literally know the procedure. Fifth, you must come with a gift. Never come before the Lord empty handed. Number seven, exalt and magnify Him on the way in and while you're there. Seven, express thanksgiving and benevolence. Thank Him for His goodness. Kings like to be bragged on. Number eight, you must be released by the king before you leave. You can never tell the king, time for me to go. It's against royal protocol. <laughs> if a king wants to keep you all day, you can't leave if you are his subject. 
The king may say, uh, wait right there. I need gone for three hours. He's supposed to wait right there. How many times God would tell you, stay here? He said, yeah, but I, I got God, I got to go eat. I got to kiss this meeting. God said, look, stay here. I'm going to save you a lot of time if you stay here. You spend five days trying to get something done. I could do it in one day, but you got to stay here. You don't leave till he tells you to leave. Abraham, Ezekiel, these guys, strange guys. God told Abraham, meet me at a place where I'll tell you when you get there. What kind of king is this? Abraham said, okay. And he got up and he started walking. One time God told Moses, go to a place. Moses said, where? Wherever, I, wherever, wherever my name is. Moses said, where that is? I can tell you when, when you reach. What kind of king is this? That's why the people got blessed. They just went and stayed where you tell them to stay. You don't leave a king's presence and tell the king tell you to leave. All right? So it's very critical that we understand the procedure. Psalm 96 says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts with worship. And the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Because he's a king. Psalm 135 verse 2 says, You who minister in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God, praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises unto his name, for that is what? Pleasant to him. Why don't you talk about it? Brag about the king. Thank you once again for listening to this message, as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.